Ouch! That hurt. That might well be your reaction this morning as we move to James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. This is a harsh passage. I warned you last week in chapter 4, watch out, because it's an in-your-face portion of Scripture, and we got through it. But if you think that was bad last week, hold on. As we come to verses 1 through 6 in James 5, it is the most harsh passage in the entire book of James. He's talking this morning about justice. Justice could be defined as the act of being just and or fair. Now, we can see justice in various aspects of life. What uh, James does is use justice in relation to the wealthy versus the poor, the rich versus those who are poverty-stricken. Now, it's rather interesting over the years how people have said poverty is not all that bad. For example, go back to the years of uh, Francis of Assisi. We uh, remember him, the prayer of Assisi, and uh, he was the um, monk who uh, loved animals. And even to this day, uh, once a year, some churches have the blessing of the animals, and uh, that comes from the ministry of the Francis of Assisi. He... um, took the vow of poverty and always felt that it was not all that bad. In fact, poverty could teach you some important lessons in life. There's only one basic problem with the poverty of Francis of Assisi. Then as you move along in history, you come to the famous Henry David Thoreau. Remember, he had the Walden experience, and when he he built a little cabin and lived for two years in the woods with only the basic necessities of life. He learned what it was to live a life of poverty. And when he had finished that, he made the statement, give me the poverty that enjoys true wealth. He's saying poverty isn't so bad. In fact, it's the true wealth. But you see, there's only one basic problem with the poverty of Henry David Thoreau. Well, let's come to, into the 19th or 20th century. And in the 1960s, late 1960s, we have the, the hippies. Um, Hippies were very much part of my early ministry. My first church was by the beach town or in the beach town of Playa del Rey. And uh, the hippies, every Sunday morning, I'd have 30 hippies sitting near the front and uh, taking notes. And uh, they were an interesting group of people. We went through the Jesus movement at that time. I've never experienced anything before or after quite like that. Uh, The hippies um, felt that Poverty was good. You see, they moved away from the establishment and uh, experienced living in poverty, and they felt it was a good experience. But there was only one basic problem with the poverty of the hippies. The same problem with Francis of Assisi and Henry David Thoreau was the problem of the hippies. This was the problem. None of these people were raised in poverty. Francis of Assisi was raised in great wealth and later in life took the vow of poverty. Henry David Thoreau was educated at Harvard. And the average hippie that I worked with came from middle or upper class families in Southern California. You see, uh, when you talk about this, there is the the ability to develop a proper self-image before they became poor. The problem with true poverty is that um, it takes away the ability to develop a true, positive self-image. For example, um, it's not just money alone that makes one poor. It is the whole effect it has on one's life. I remember a millionaire, a member of one of my former churches. I haven't found any in this church yet. But anyway, I did have a millionaire in a previous church, and he was very supportive of the church, thank goodness. But I remember one Sunday morning after the service, he said to me, you know, Pastor John, I struggle with my self-image. 
And I thought, how interesting. I mean, he had a lovely home in the Midwest. He had an a, a, a apartment or a condo uh, and, uh, looking over the ocean in, in Florida. He drove the biggest and best cars, took European vacations, money on as the president of a massive corporation, and yet he was struggling with self-image. But you see, the man was raised in poverty. And so the image that he developed in those years of poverty, he always struggled with that. I was raised in a poor family, and I struggled with my self-image. Uh, who am I to get in front of anybody and say anything? It's, it's all part of the, uh, of the complex personality that develops when you are poor from your youth. And so um, James looks at this, and he looks at people who were very wealthy and were not just in their relationships to the poor, and his heart goes out to the poor because they're insecure, and they are developing an insecure relationship for the rest of their lives. And so he comes very strong on this. Because of the totality of poverty, the Bible speaks strongly against social injustice. We see this in the Old Testament. Men like uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos spoke against social injustice. And today in the New Testament, James speaks very harshly about the injustice that the wealthy were bringing upon the poor. Now remember, injustice is in all kinds of life. He's using the wealth versus poverty as an illustration of the injustice in the social life. So let's begin. First of all, notice in our passage, wealth and justice. First of all, the oppressor or the haves. Verse, uh, first of all, he talks about how they obtain their wealth. Verse 4, look, look, the wages you failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. He's not talking now to the scattered people from his congregations. He's referring to the Palestinian Jew, and he's remembering the law in Deuteronomy chapter 24 that says the employer must pay the employee every single day. And what was happening, of course, is the wealthy were not doing this. And so what type of wealth did they possess? Well, there was grain, verse 2, your wealth has rotted. Oh, and there's clothing and moths have eaten your clothes. We want to remember that in Bible times, uh, uh, the clothing was an extremely important possession because it, it, it gave you uh, 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 esteem in life. Um, so it was very, very important. And it is to, to our day to some extent. If you have nothing else to do sometime, uh, look on your TV guide and watch the uh, tele. Uh, the, the program called Say Yes to the Dress. Has anyone here ever heard of that one? Say Yes to the Dress. Oh, it's a very interesting program. You won't want to be attached to it all the time, but it um, comes from this uh, big bridal store in New York City where the, the gowns begin at $2,000 and go up to a little bit over $30,000. A, a wedding gown that you wear for a few hours one day. And it's very interesting that people come there and uh, they sit around like this bride and they pass judgment on these, these gowns that come out. And, and the bride might like one gown and the mother doesn't, so the bride cries and goes back and tries on another one. And you see all the interaction. The psychology is so interesting how these people react to this dress and finally uh, she finds the dress she likes and they're all happy and they say, do you say yes to the dress? And she says, yes, I say yes to the dress. And some will take that dress, $25,000, $30,000 dress and go get married. Well, you know, if, you, if, you, if you can afford it, okay, as long as you haven't gotten your money from unjust or in, uh, injustice in relation to people. Uh, the people James is talking about were wealthy, could afford, yes, to the dress, but they got their money in the wrong way. So uh, he says also they had gold and silver, verse, excuse me, verse 3, gold and silver are corroded. That's the kind of wealth they had. Then notice how they used their wealth. In verse 3, it says they hoarded it. You have hoarded wealth, not just saved it, but hoarded it. And that word hoarded is very interesting. By the way, if you don't want to watch Say Yes to the Dress, then watch the hoarder uh, 
program. <laughs> Have any of you seen the hoarder program? Oh, yeah. I mean, how interesting. People that, that have much more than they need, and, and they're just hoarding it. And sometimes they hoard it in a mess, like you see here, and you can't even hardly walk in the house because they're hoarding it, have far more than they need, but they're hanging on to it. Sometimes it's a total mess. I uh, saw one program where the hoarding looked like this. Very, very nice and neat, 60,000 cans of beer. One man was hoarding. And the whole idea of hoarding, you're obsessed by that, and you hoard and you hold back far more. He would, I would never drink that many cans of beer, I wouldn't think, in a lifetime, but maybe. But why would you hoard at this? And it's, it's an obsession with something, and almost every time as you go back in the lives of these people, something has happened that brought insecurity in their lives, and so they don't just save things, they hoard things. And that's the word he uses here about the wealth, wealthy people that James is looking at. He says, you're not just saving money, you're hoarding things. You're hoarding far more than you ever need and probably far more than you will ever use. And not only did they hoard, but it says in verse 5, they wasted. Look at that. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. And then thirdly, they controlled the courts with their wealth. Verse 6. You have condemned and killed good people who had no power to defend themselves against you. Remember the golden rule? Did you learn that in school? Basically, the golden rule is what? Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, have you ever heard of the um, oppressor's golden rule? It goes like this, you know, um, those who have the gold make the rules. And that's the golden rule in operation here. James says you have money, you hoard it, and you waste it to some degree, and you use it to make the rules. And so the oppressor has nothing they can do because they're hopeless and they're helpless because of the wealthy oppressor. And so um, we want to notice what happens to their wealth. In verse 2, the grain is going to rot. The clothing, verse 2, moths eaten. And then the gold and silver will be corroded. In the New American Bible, it says rusted. Actually, it simply means it will lose its value. And we well experienced that in the last few years uh, as the stock market crushed and uh, everything has fallen down. And so this the next picture pretty well explains to us what he means by the gold is going to rust. It's going to lose its value. So you're hanging on to stuff that really isn't going to count. Now that's the oppressor. Notice, uh, secondly here, the oppressed or the have-nots. The action of the rich toward the poor is seen in verse 6, the first part. You have condemned and murdered innocent men. Now, what does that mean? Uh, let's say I have a friend uh, named John, and uh, I said, maybe talking to you, and I said, you know, yesterday um, John was assassinated, but John's standing next to me. And so I'm talking to you and say, John, he was assassinated yesterday. And, and you go, how can that be? If I said this, uh, yesterday I was talking with some of John's so-called friends, and boy, did they assassinate him. The assassination of character. And when you look at this, it's very interesting. Uh, the reaction of the, of, the, of the rich toward the poor is that they um, actually assassinated the character of the poor because they didn't like the poor. Uh, very interesting. Uh, maybe you've heard, I'm sure you've heard of Socrates. Back in the days when Socrates was a teacher, he had a student, El, El, um, Alcibiades, and Alcibiades had total respect for Socrates. But Alcibiades was a very immoral person. Socrates was not known for immorality. He was a much more immoral person. But Alcibiades lived a low life. I ran across a picture on the Internet painted years ago about uh, Socrates and Alcibiades, and it shows Socrates pulling Alcibiades away from the bed of um, a woman of the world. 
It's kind of interesting that Alcibiades, being so evil, respected Socrates and, and thought so highly of what he taught. But this one who loved Socrates said this. One day Alcibiades says, Socrates, I hate you. For every time I see you, you show me what I am. Hmm. Every time he looked at his teacher, he realized what a low life he was. And so he hated the teacher in that respect. Now, James is using the same idea here. He said, when the rich looked at the poor, they assassinated their character. They hated the poor because when they looked at the poor, it reminded them of how evil they were because what they did caused the poor to be poor. Interesting. So uh, that was the action of the rich toward the poor. But then you have the reaction of the poor in the last part of verse 6. Who had no power to defend themselves against you. We've looked at the golden rule and the golden rule of the rich. There's also what I would call the ungolden rule. It goes like this. Do one to others as they do one to you. And this is the normal reaction. You do one to me, man, I'll do one to you. But the poor did not respond that way. They actually had no power to do that. Uh, their motto would be, you know, payday someday. Someday payday. And that's exactly what was going to happen. If you go back to verse 1, someday payday, he speaks of the misery that's coming on you, you wealthy people who are using your wealth unjustly. Verse 3, your riches will testify against you. Verse 5, and that will be the day of slaughter. Hmm. Wealth and justice. But now he also considers wealth and judgment. Look at verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Interesting word, howl. Uh, I had a sister who howled a lot. And um, it was kind of interesting because if she was real happy, you could almost hear howls coming from her room. Or when she got engaged and she had this beautiful ring and uh, someone might we would say, to, hey, did you get an engagement ring? She was happy. I mean, it would never sound that way, but and anyone would respond to that beautiful ring. But, my goodness sakes. And uh, then when she was sad, she would howl. I mean, she got engaged and she got married. And then I remember her you know, leaving the house for the last time. Well, whew, it was a terrible experience because she was howling then. You know, oh, my God, I'm raised here. I, I, you know, I lost my first tooth in that door. You know? And so you had, why are you howling? So she would howl you know, because she was happy and, or she was sad. So, so you'd have to see the context of this howling. Very interesting word. Homer uses that word in uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And Homer talks about pagan women howling in thankfulness to their pagan god. So it's the same word that James uses, but it was a good word. They were howling because God, their pagan god, had been good to them. So it's an interesting word as you study it, and you have to interpret how in the context of things. Well, how about here? It says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. It's a bad howl, and uh, misery is going to come. There'll be judgment. The judge of Christ will be Christ. Christ judges the unbeliever, what's called the great white throne judgment. There's also the uh, judgment for service for the believer, the bema. That's the judge. And then if you go to verse 3, you have the witness. He says in verse 3, Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will witness against you. I was a very ingenious child, you know, always thinking of better ways of doing things. And we were poor, but we were clean. My mother had this big thing about being clean. I remember once, every, every Saturday night, I, she checked behind my ears. 
Did your mother do that and took a rag and couldn't have any wax? And I, I just hated that. And your room had to be clean. And we were poor, so we didn't have carpeting. We had linoleum, and my room had linoleum, my bedroom, and I had to clean it. She made me clean my bedroom. It was, it, we didn't have child protection services in those days, and uh, I had to do it. And so uh, she taught me how to take a broom and how you sweep things, and then how you use the dustpan. Remember your mom taught you that? You sweep the dirt into a little pile, you put the dustpan down, and you sweep it in. Then you move the dustpan back, and you, keep swept, and you keep moving it back until there's no more dirt going in there. Well, that takes time. And then you go take the pan and dump it in the, in the trash. Well, you spill it sometimes on the way. Then you have to go get a broom. And, you know, forget that. There's got to be a better way. And so because I was so ingenious, I figured a way, probably no one has ever thought of this, and that is sweep the dirt under the rug. And I thought I was the only one that ever thought of that, but I ran across this picture on the internet, and uh, somebody else thought of it too. You, you sweep it under the rug, and mom would check the room, and my goodness, you a good little boy, I get my allowance and everything. And, and then one day she pull the rug up, you know, and then, and then this is what she saw. And the dust under the rug witnessed against me. He's saying that's what's going to happen to you, you wealthy people who are unjust. You can hide your injustice just so long, and then will come the day of judgment when the Lord the judge will pull back the rug and all your injustice will come forth. You can hide it just so long. Look at verse four. The wages you hold back cry out against you. The cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. That's the witness of the verdict. Verse five, slaughter. That's interesting. I had three sisters, and they all married farmers. And I remember one time going down to my sister's farm in South Dakota, and they had a, a pig pen, about five or seven pigs in the thing. And I remember going down there and watching these pigs, and they just rolled in the mud, and then they would eat and eat and eat. And I'm an animal lover. So I remember standing there one day and, and trying to help these poor creatures and saying to them, hey, my brother-in-law is feeding you, feeding you up for the slaughter. And it's, then I, they didn't hear. So again, I said, hey, they're feeding you up for the slaughter. And you know what those pigs did? They just kept eating. And that's sort of the picture of the wealthy. He says, you know, uh, you just keep doing what you're doing? In fact, in verse 5, he says, um, now your hearts are nice and fat. Ah. And soon will come the slaughter. In other words, their hearts were hard and fast and, and nothing moved them anymore. Nothing touched them. They had taken this wealth they had used it to, to force themselves upon people, even in the courts, and they were so hardened that nothing touched them anymore. Think of the man a number of year, girl, years ago that told me I can watch those commercials about the children starving in India and starving in, in Africa, and I can watch news reports about these starving kids. I've seen it so much that it doesn't even bother me anymore. So, so James has said, well, you know, that's not right. And so he concludes with wealth and joy. For the believer, wealth should bring joy. He uses the ungodly rich in verses 1 through 6 today, you and your in his harshness. We'll see next time that he's going to talk about Christians, and he uses brothers and sisters about four times. Now, the difference is this. Christians may have riches, but they don't let riches get into their hearts. Billy Graham said, we have, in God we trust on our coins, but me first in our hearts. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's a matter of what you do with it or your relation to it. As you look at the Old Testament, you find the followers after God who were wealthy. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jonah, Elijah would be some of them. On into the New Testament, people like uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who let Jesus borrow that tomb, remember? You have people like Philemon. Actually, Lydia would be another very wealthy person. So there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's what we do with it. Are we just with it? And so today, there are also rich. Uh, I was fascinated by this. The uh, Interreligious Foundation for a Community Organization came up with this. If we could turn the population of the earth into a small community of 100 people, keeping the same proportions we have today, it would be something like this. Unable to read, 70. College educated, one. Suffering from malnutrition, 50 plus. It's half the world population. Substandard housing, they list at 80. But this is what's interesting. Six are Americans and have one half the village income. Did you get that? 94 people live on the other one half of the income. And what this tells us as believers that American Christians are a part of the rich. No matter how poor you are. You say, well, I'm on food stamps. Well, half the world is starving without food stamps. You're rich compared to them. And so what James is saying to us, you know, um, hey, we're rich. We're just like the rich of his day. But what are we doing with it? Are we being people of justice? Are we using our wealth for the glory of God? Is there a balance? Is there a rationale to what we're doing? Remember back in Sunday school? We used to sing a song that kind of was the answer to um, injustice. The words went like this, Jesus and others and you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others in you in the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others we meet face to face. Y is for you. In whatever you do, put yourself third and spell joy. That's the Christian way. And why we kind of leave that song in the Sunday school room, I don't know. Because it's the basis of Christian living that James reminds us. It's one of the building blocks for, for life in Christ or for, uh, for Christian maturity. It's a watch out, not just in wealth or it's whatever you do, that we are to be just. We need to be fair. We need to be right by putting Jesus first, others second, and me third. I hope this doesn't embarrass you. It shouldn't, but I can't think of a better one. So let's sing. Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you, in the heart of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others we meet face to face. Y is for you in whatever you do. Put yourself third and spell joy. In conclusion, just remember that we must be fair. Be just and are fair, and do what is right and righteous. That's what he's saying to us. And he's harsh about it, because too often we forget that. You might be saying, well, what in the world does justice have to do with chariots? Well, uh, quite a bit. So we'll come with me in closing back to um, 66 AD. My wife and I were married in 66, but it was 1966. This is way back. 
In 66 AD, uh, in Rome, who was the ruler? Do you remember? Nero. Nero ruled. And he was an unjust man. He didn't know what the word justice meant. Well, in 66 was the Olympics in Greece. And so um, Nero decided that he was going to enter the Olympics and uh, be part of the chariot races. He had no right to do that. He didn't go through the rules and the regulations. But he went to Greece and he forced himself upon the Olympic Committee. And he said he was going to be running in that race. And he used his power against them and was part of the chariot races. Usually they had uh, two, maybe four, sometimes three uh, horses. So he used ten. So here comes Nero competing with the others with his ten horses, and obviously he's going to use his power unjustly to win that race. Well, the race started, he started, and at that time he was getting older, he was fat, he was undisciplined, and he fell off the chariot. And so they, they tried to, you know, they helped him get back on, and um, then he you know, kept going, uh, going again. Of course, he lost the race. No one knows who won, by the way, because he used his power to proclaim himself as the winner. And Nero said, if I hadn't fallen off the chariot, I would have won. So that was his rationale. He didn't win, but he took the honor, and he demanded the crown, that wreath, to be given to him. No one knows who the winner was. Nero had an entourage. And so as they went back from Greece to Rome, and they came into the, the big city of, uh, where he, in Rome, he uh, had his entourage, you know, just shout, and victory for Nero, the winner, the winner, and so on. Well, the people all knew he didn't win. They all knew that he unjustly used his power to make himself the winner when he didn't even finish the race. But you didn't dare say anything lest you be beheaded. That was 66 AD. Now come with me a year forward to 67 AD. That's the year the Apostle Paul died. He was uh, persecuted, beheaded by the persecutors under Nero in the year 67 AD. But what was interesting is that before Paul died, he wrote his letters to Timothy. And he says in Timothy, remember 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8, he says, my departure is soon at hand. I'm going to die. And then he says in verse 7, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Therefore, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge will give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those that love is appearing. Well, did you catch what Paul said? You know, for years, I, I didn't really catch what he was saying. This is his last little message, and he uh, speaking here of justice. Did you hear what he said? I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. A subtle statement that everybody knew what he was saying. He finished the race and was going to be given a crown of righteousness, righteousness, the right thing which the righteous judge would give. People who read that in his day knew exactly, and they probably smiled. Oh, we know what Paul's saying. A subtle statement. But one of the last things he says to us in his own subtle way is you must be, be right. You must do it justly in every area of life you must do what is right do not usurp your power or anything else we as christians must be christians of justice amen will you stand with me And just as we close, let's bow our heads for a moment and just to examine our own lives. Might there be somewhere in our life, not necessarily with money, but there's all kinds of areas where we're just not really doing what's right. 
And so let's take Paul's little subtle hint that, that you need to do what's right. You don't take the crown that you didn't earn. You do what's right. Maybe as the Lord brings something to mind about that, then determine this morning to do something, to change that and become people of justice. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, sometimes it's convicting. It's kind of harsh as we see James today. But, but at times we need that, Lord. So, so thank you for the message. Help us to change areas that we need to change in order that we would be people who are just and fair and living righteous lives for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen.